Um, if, if you are here you ha- or you haven't been here for a while, we started this series in the fall, and it's been kind of an interesting one. Um, we've been unpacking, I think, some really, um, some really fascinating ideas around Jesus, around who he is. We've actually been walking through the book of Matthew, and we've been looking at the life of Jesus and his mission and his purpose and really how, th- how that impacts us from the book of Matthew. So looking at the life of Jesus as presented in this gospel or this biography uh, of Jesus, and there's a couple of different reasons that we've been doing this, and I've said this um, throughout the series, and some of you, I know you've probably heard it so many times if you've been here every week, but I just want to be consistent in reminding us why we're taking the time to do this. I just want to refresh your memory, and so this could be review for some of you, some of you that maybe haven't been around. I just want to explain that one of the primary reasons that we're doing this series and why we're spending the time is because frequently there are misconceptions in our culture today. In fact, I'd say that um, so many people, the vast majority of people, people inside of churches and outside of churches, have real misunderstanding about Jesus. Um, There's lots of reasons. We've been unpacking like a few as we move through the series. There are things that come out. Sometimes it's things that people did. Sometimes it's things that people have said, people like me standing in churches. Um, Sometimes it's just their own misconceptions from things they read or their preconceived notions or them reading into things. Whatever the case is, the truth is that we live in a culture today where probably more than ever, we need to clarify who Jesus is and what he's all about. Um, there's probably more misunderstanding, more, uh, more questions about the relevancy of Jesus and how we apply his truth, probably that's, than ever have, have existed in any culture than the one that we exist in right now. And so there's a real essential na- nature to this. There's something that we really need to do. And so we've been walking through this. In fact, probably the first six weeks of this, and yes, it's been six weeks, today's the seventh. The first six weeks of this, we've been unpacking some very fundamental principles. And, and those principles, some of those things we've been looking at, um, I know I've had some great conversations with people saying, man, I've never understood Christianity or Jesus from this perspective, and it's kind of rattling the foundation. Um, Those things actually are the foundation, and the reason that we've been talking about these things in the order that we have is on purpose, because today we're going to be talking about really beginning the conversation, the second reason why we're doing this series. It has to do with the title of the series, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, that there's actually outcomes that take place in this life as a result of who Jesus is, and so we're shifting the direction a little bit. We're beginning to move towards now what does it mean for us to live this life out? And it's incredibly important as we do this that we cover the kind of stuff that we covered along the way. I mean, one of the reasons that people have misconceptions about Jesus is that oftentimes they've heard something about him, one of his teachings, they've taken something they've read, and they see it out of context, like they just see some comment, which any one of us, if someone took one sound bite, we know this, one sound bite and said, that's who we are, we'd go, oh, wait a second, there's a lot more than a sound bite, right? And sometimes those sound bites, sometimes the things that people hear, if they don't come with that foundation that should have preceded it, or if they haven't seen these things in order, then they don't make sense. Um, it's kind of like Ikea furniture. How many of you have put together Ikea furniture before? Raise your hand up. Let's commiserate together. Raise your hand up tall, because we're, we're, yeah, we're a proud few, right? Those of you that haven't put Ikea furniture together, if you ever want to, here's the good news. Um, after you do three pieces, you get a fully accredited um, degree in engineering, after you do this, it's awesome, yeah. So yeah, there's some association that says, hey, you've passed like the ultimate test in engineering, you put together IKEA furniture. Um, those of you that have done this, you know, like there's a temptation when you open the box. Well, the first temptation is to burn it all, right? Because like you saw it in the store, in a magazine, you're like, oh, that looks good. And then you got it home, and you're like, it's just a bunch of parts, like it's just a bunch of wood, like it looks like somebody just grabbed scraps. And my tendency when I see that is I'm very conceptual, and very spatial in my thinking, not special. Spatial, it's how I see things, not special at all. So I, I'm, I happen to see a picture, and so for me, if I see something, immediately I go to, oh, I can do that. And I look at the parts, and I already start imagining how all the parts go together. And so when I've ever done this sort of thing, I usually start without the directions. This is not a stubborn man thing. This is just a weird Brad thing, okay? Okay. And so many times, I'm like in the middle of this, and I'm grabbing the glue to glue the dowels and make this thing permanent, and Sherry will walk in, and she'll go, are you sure you should, should do that? <laughs> and you know what? She's always right. Like, and there's no way I should be making permanent whatever I'm doing with this furniture, because inevitably, I skip a step. And Ikea has this way of like, of like tricking you into like thinking you're almost done, but then, aha, there's this last final piece, and if you did these things out of order, it all falls apart in front of your eyes. Um, In a very strange way, Jesus is very much like this. 
There are things that we need to understand. There are things that we need to have in our hearts. There are things that we need to to have clear in our regard of Jesus before we start diving into other things that he says. Otherwise, the things that he said can be taken religiously. They can be taken out of context. They can be taken in a way that never makes sense with who he really is. So it's always important that we do what we've done here. And that's talk about things like what we've talked about. We've talked about the, the, the radical nature of the message of Jesus. We've talked about this idea of repentance being us changing our worldview, changing our thinking, our understanding about the world in light of our now knowledge of God's nearness to us and what he's doing in the world. We've talked about confessing or agreeing with God about human brokenness, about our brokenness. It's essential. Like If we want to understand what God's doing, we have to agree that we're broken we have to do those things. We've talked about quantum physics in a little bit, a little splash of quantum physics. We've talked about the nearness of God. We've talked about the dimensions of the universe and the, the reality that God moves and lives in our presence, that we have a God who is near to us. We've talked about Acts chapter 17 where the apostle Paul said that, that we, we find ourselves moving and living and having our being in God this concept that brings a dimension to a three-dimensional world that we never think of, this, this kind of thinking that, that, that feels very different than the modernistic intellectual version of our faith that we typically practice. Um, we've talked about God meeting us in our desperation like last week. All of these things are essential for us to understand God's love, his grace, his mercy, his nearness before we move to what we're looking at today, before we start unpacking this. Because Jesus is going to begin to get increasingly practical about our lives. But if we don't have it clear about who we are and who God is, his goodness and his love for us, then these things become religiosity. So Jesus is gathering people around him, not necessarily on purpose. It's just happening because he's so compelling. This happens around Jesus. And we we saw in Matthew chapter 5 as we began last week that the crowd got bigger and bigger. And as the crowd got bigger, Jesus decides to go up on a hillside and begins to instruct them on his ways, on what he's all about. That begins the Sermon on the Mount. And we started that whole thing last week by looking at the Beatitudes. What's fascinating is the Beatitudes close. And as God is reminding these people that he meets them in the middle of their mess, that he meets them at the end of their rope, As he does this, he then moves to a statement about them that is incredibly simple. It's very plain. It's straightforward. But it literally has the potential to change how every single one of us view our life and why we exist on this planet. And I don't say that mildly. I I think, you know, there's times where you say, okay, uh, Brad, every week he gets passionate. I do. I can get fired up about stuff. But this is not some sort of, like, speaker's trick to make you listen for another 25 minutes. Very truly and very sincerely, what he says next, after he says, I meet you in the mess, what he says next truly transforms how you and I view every single day that we live. It totally redefines our purpose for life, totally redefines why we wake up in the morning and what we do when we wake up in the morning and and where we go and how we interact and how we live this life. This redefines everything. And what's ironic about it is that he he, he uses a very simple set of illustrations to unpack this for us, but it's something that's brilliant in regard to what it changes in us. Jesus is gonna talk about salt and he's gonna talk about light. Salt and light, two very basic things, like salt, like grab the shaker, shake it out, salt, not shake it off, shake it out, salt, right? Salt and light, like click, 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 like the light switch, light, like salt and light, pretty basic things, right? Totally life transforming. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, this is what he says. He's talking to this group of people, and he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory 
to your Father who's in heaven. Well, sincerely, part of me wonders that as Jesus is like diving into this and he looks at these people and says, you are salt. Like part of me wonders, are they like, really? <laughs> like this is encouraging? Like we're salt. We're, we're salt. Like this is the best you can do? Like, this is, like they're looking at Jesus saying, come on, feed us. Give us something good. And he's like, you are light. And they're like, what is he getting at, right? Like what is this all about? Like what is Jesus saying here? Well, Jesus is telling them something about who they are, and he's telling us something about who we are, and he's telling them something about the world in which they live, and simultaneously he's telling us something about the world that we live in. I want to unpack this. Now, we think of salt very differently. So we hear this, and we picture salt shaker, you know, spread it out there. We think of salt in that regard, right? We think of sodium. We think of this thing that we add to food when somebody's cooked food that's bland, right? And some of you, you add too much of this, which is why you take pills, right? So you have issues because of salt. That's what we think of salt, right? Salt, what do we use salt for? For flavor, right? We, we use salt for flavoring. It's an additive. It's something we put on food after we've cooked it, right? That's what we do. Um, salt to these people was, was very different. In fact, I'm not sure it's any more encouraging. Like, we look at it as it's kind of this useless, but, or not useless, but this very common thing. And I'm not sure that w- what they understood salt to be changes the perspective of, that Jesus may have been giving them significantly from ours. Is like, what is this? But, but when you understand the purpose, it really does open our eyes to something. To these people, salt was not an additive. Salt was something different. What was it? It was a preservative, right? So we're living in a culture here. Jesus is looking at a group of people. They have no electricity. They have have no ice boxes, right? They have no means of of keeping meat. And so the only way that they can preserve meat is through the use of of salt. There are these stories, like when you read the New Testament and you hear the stories of the guys dragging in the nets of all the fish, there's part of you that when you think about a world without electricity or refrigeration, you go, Wow, what'd they do with all the fish, right? what did they do? Like, why did they catch all these fish if they couldn't eat them all right away? Well, they preserved them with salt. And so they would pack the fish in salt. Specifically, this culture that Jesus is talking to, the disciples who were fishermen and the people who had lived by the Sea of Galilee who have gathered around him in this moment, salt-packed fish was something they lived with every single day. Salt was what allowed them to, to avoid famine in their nation. Salt was something that kept the fish from decomposing, Right? Because the fish without the salt would rot. They would disintegrate. So the salt preserves. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt for this earth. Now this is really fascinating. We've talked in this series about words that sometimes get misunderstood as we translate them. It's always important, like the word heaven gets used very different ways in the New Testament. This word earth is also a very interesting one for us. We understand salt, but now earth, what's he talking about? Well, very clearly, Jesus is describing the soil around us. He's using a word that describes the present. He's using a word that describes what's happening all around us now, in the here and now. He's talking about the present reality, this earth, the terra firma, this place that you're standing. There's this idea of relevancy to the moment that they're in. He says, you are the salt of the soil. You are the salt of this moment. You are the salt of of the here and now. Now, obviously, that's a statement that's being made about them, right? He's saying something about them, saying, this is who you are. But simultaneously, as he describes them as salt, he's also describing something about the earth, isn't he? He's saying this present environment, this present soil, this present place in which we find ourselves is rotting. It's disintegrating. This present place around us is a place that has a trajectory towards decomposition. Things are breaking down. There's a rhythm. The things around us are not staying as they are. They're breaking apart. Um, As I age and I get over 40, I discover this to be true in my own life. How many of you over 40, like, know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, some of you are like, I'm not over 40. Yeah, you are. Admit it. Some of you are, like, celebrating the anniversary of your 39th birthday. Not cool. You're, like, 48, but... Some of you, that's like, you'll get that one later, the anniversary of your 39th birthday, right? I remember guys would say to me, like, just wait till you're 40, and I was like, yeah, whatever. 
now I'm 40. I'm like, really? Yesterday, uh, my daughter, she played in two soccer games yesterday, and the first morning game was early. We showed up there. Um, this is kind of funny because um, last week I started, I, like, they let me stand on the coach's side of the field, um, which I used to coach soccer when the girls were young, but then I think I got banished for a while. And now I'm on the other side, like I'm with the coaches. And so I was like, this is really fun. They said, well, why don't you help us every week? And I was like, you know, are you sure? I'm, I'm actually kind of thinking, I'm kind of wondering in my mind, this is what I really think. I think they knew they couldn't get me to shut up on the parent side, so they might as well move me to the coach's side so there was a little more control, right? I'd work, at least work with somebody with, you know, the things I was telling the kids on the field. So I, so I was kind of excited. I showed up yesterday. I was like, hey, week number two, like, I love coaching. This is really fun. So I showed up on the field, and uh, as we're hanging out there waiting for the game to start, no officials show up. Like, no officials, like, no refs, nobody shows up. And so we're kind of hanging out, and, like, we're running. We're trying to pull guys off of other crews, and they're like, no, we got to stay here. And so finally, like, they look at me, and they go, hey, um, we're going to need your help, which at that moment, I realized this is their way of keeping me quiet, right? Because if I'm refing, I can't, like, coach. And so, um, so they asked me to do, like, the line judge thing, the AR judge, right? Some of you, if you've been around soccer, you know what this guy does? Anyone? You know what you do? Yeah, this guy just runs, right, back and forth. And so I'm just like running, jogging, you know, and like trying to, you know, call off sides and, you know, call in the inbounds, the direction, whose possession it is, those things. You know, I'm doing this. And, uh, and so like I'm kind of having fun, right? It's okay. It's not a bad thing to do until I woke up this morning and I was like, why are my hamstrings really sore? <laughs> right? Like why? Why are my ham? And I'm like, because oh, I ran for 15 minutes up and down a sideline yesterday, right? Because that's what it means to get over 40, Right? You, like, do something that you used to not consider exercise, and now 15 minutes of jogging, and you're like, oh, that's exercise. Man, I worked out, right? Because <laughs> there's a trajectory with age, right? You slowly get older, and you disintegrate. Can I get an amen, right? Amen. amen. You feel that. That's the world in which we live. We live in a world where things have this tendency to decompose. They disintegrate around us, and what Jesus is saying in this is this massive statement. He's saying, do you understand that in the places where you work and you play and you go to school and where you live, things are naturally breaking apart. The world is broken and it's messy. He, he gives another illustration in verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world, which again, if you look at this the other way, obviously he's making a statement about the people he's speaking to, but he's also simultaneously making a statement about the world in which we live. We know what light is, right? We don't have to unpack that. What does light do? It drives out darkness, right? Some of you are like, don't get scientific on me again, right? Because you know light is a wave, and no, I'm just not going to go there with you. But Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And when he makes that statement, by saying they're the light, he's simultaneously saying that the world is dark. So salt stops decomposition, and light drives out darkness. So we have salt and light, and we have decomposition, and we have darkness. We have salt being shaken, and it changes things. We have light entering the room, and it drives out darkness. Earlier, I mentioned Acts 17. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, too. By the way, the book of Acts is this um, story of the church after the Gospels. So if some of you wonder sometimes, like, what's Acts all about? It's actually the beginning story of how the church began and how the church spread over the known world. And in Acts chapter 17, there's this really cool story where the Apostle Paul, who has been traveling all over the known world, telling people about Jesus and who he is and the things we've been describing in this series, and at a certain point in Acts 17, he finds himself in the city of Athens, and, and Athens is the, like the the pinnacle of philosophy at the time, right? Like Athens is the place where the experts, the people we read about in history books, either came from or would come from in the future or were there when Paul was present. Athens is the place where people went to talk about life and, and what life is all about, the meaning of life, to talk about God and, and who he is and, and how humanity relates to God. Athens is the, the pinnacle of human thought. And the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 finds himself there, and as was his nature, he found himself having these critical conversations with people, right, describing this finding himself in moments where he would unpack this message of Jesus. And in one particular moment, as he's talking to these philosophers, these thinkers, he describes their condition, and he does it so interestingly. He says, these people, as you search, as you craft your philosophies, and as you seek for your answers, it's as if you're groping in the darkness. You're feeling your way 
through the dark. You're searching for God in darkness. Why? Because the world is a dark place. Because the world is a place where people fumble, feeling for something that's real. We, we long for something. Like the masses in general are searching for something that they can hold on to. That's why religion exists. That's why religiosity is there. That's why belief systems crop up, because people want some sort of explanation because the world is dark. And in their darkness, they were just grasping. Somebody makes sense of all of this that's going on in life, and so we reach and we grasp for things. Kind of as a side note of that, every now and then there are people that you hear about, and, and for me in my life, plenty of them, who in the course of life, maybe growing up around the Christian religion, at some point became so unenamored with the religiosity become so, so unenamored with just the intellectualism and the lack of personal nature of Jesus, the distance from a God who actually comes near, that they begin to go explore other systems. And then they find something. Like, we all have these stories, right? You guys know somebody, maybe you've been on this journey, and you know someone that goes, and they're like, oh, man, I've been reading these books, or I've been trying these things, or I visited this temple or this house of worship, and there was something there, right? There was something, and they're trying to grasp hold of it, right? They're trying to get something out of this because whatever that is feels more alive than whatever it was that they left. Can I just say this about this? Whatever it is that they're finding, they're finding in the darkness. And whatever sense of truth they're, they're finding, that is not a statement that validates what it is they're discovering. It's actually a statement that only speaks to the lack of what they found in their Christian religiosity. Of course they're finding something other places because they were just as in the dark here as they are now. So we, we search in the darkness. We search for something that we can lay hold of. Now, in America, um, our religion is predominantly materialism, consumerism, and that isn't some sort of cheap reference. That's not some sort of joke. That truly is our religion. If you think about how we live our lives, consumerism or materialism is it. We've actually rebranded it, though. We rebranded consumerism, and we call it something that sounds very noble. We call it the pursuit of what? Happiness, right? But the pursuit of happiness in America is really just a, like a great rebrand of I'm a consumer. I'm materialistic. That's what it is. Like somebody, like marketing guys, they take their cue from whoever came up with that, right? Because in, in our culture, that's what we do. We try to define life. We, 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 we search in the darkness. We try to find in the darkness something that will make this life mean something. And so we look for it in, in terms of what we can consume, what we can explain, what we can buy with our, our, our money or hold in our hands. We, we try to find purpose in, in relationships or in some sort of degree or some sort of pursuit. All of these things we're grasping in the darkness, hoping that at some point these things will resolve whatever that darkness dark feeling is that we have. It'll somehow take away the disintegration that we're experiencing. And so we grasp for these things in the pursuit of happiness. Here's what's fascinating. We pursue happiness, but if you ask people in America today and they, you ask them, hey, do you want to be happy? What does everybody say? Yeah, right? Unless you're Eeyore, right? <laughs> He's the one exception who's like, no, I just like it like this, right? And actually, we all know like one or two or three Eeyores, right? They're, they're, they're the exception, right? But everybody that says, hey, I want to be happy, and you go, well, you want to be happy, how do you discover happiness? If you ask people this question, do you know what you discover more and more as you ask it? They don't know. They don't know. Like, you want to be happy? Yeah. How do, you, how do you get happy? I don't know. I, and you know why they don't know? because they've been grasping, groping in the darkness for something that matters. And if they live any length of time, they start realizing, well, the degree didn't fill me up, and the job didn't fill me up, and the relationships didn't fill me up, and the stuff didn't fill me up, and they grasp. And so that form of religion is just as dark as anything else, as any philosophy that Paul himself ran against. See, if, if the world needs salt, it means that things are messed up and disintegrating, and if the world needs light, it means that it can also be a very dark place. So let me just read this again, verse 13. Jesus says, you, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? 
It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. The world is broken, the world's dark, and and Jesus is talking to this group of people, and you know what he's acknowledging? Whatever system it is that's been pitched to you, it it isn't doing it, including religion. Think about Jesus in, in regard to the religious leaders and the Pharisees of his day. Who was it that Jesus was always going after? It was the religious people, right? Because at the heart of what the Jews and the Pharisees, what they were practicing in those days, it was religiosity. It was people obeying to somehow manipulate God or feel better about themselves. And you know what Jesus recognizes that we need to recognize is this, that religion doesn't change anything. Religion, jumping through hoops, obeying the list of biblical rules does not change who you are. It doesn't transform you. It doesn't make you a different sort of person. It doesn't shape neighborhoods. It doesn't transform institutions. It doesn't influence culture positively. It doesn't do that. And so Jesus is making this point. He's doing what he's doing because whether you are the masses pursuing something in the darkness or whether you are pursuing something in religious motivation, it doesn't matter. You, in either case, you're, you're, you're in this place of absolute darkness and brokenness. The religious, they pursue things to feel better about themselves, to get approval, to somehow feel like what they're doing or how they're living can be approved by someone. But at the end of the day, it's all the same. But when you hear the words of Jesus about the nearness of God, about his proximity to us in every moment of every day, when you hear Jesus' words about grace and mercy being extended to us, when you experience personally the transformation of knowing your desperation and your brokenness and God's absolute total mercy on you and his love for you, that's what changes you. Something, like when you come face to face with the heart of a loving father, there's something something that happens in you, like something takes place and that completely separates you from those who are living in the dark. It's like, flipping on a light in a dark room. The darkness is gone and everything is different when you see what Jesus is all about, when you experience him personally, when you know this. See, salt and light people, they're just different in some sort of weird way. Salt and light people, they live towards places and they live towards possessions differently than everybody else. Salt and light people, they hold on more loosely to things. They, they don't take everything in this physical, visible world so seriously. They, they're the kind of people who allow other things to define them, not the rules and regulations of our culture or religion. Um, it, Peter said this to the early church in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Listen to this. Listen to what he says about these people. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness, right? Right? and into his wonderful light. I love this, man. He says, you, you're a chosen people, not they. This isn't some other group of people. He's looking at the same group of people, the same kinds of people that Jesus was speaking to on the hillside in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's using language that was normally kept and reserved for Israel, and now he's applying it to all of these people, and he's saying, you are a chosen people people. You, there's something about you because you've been drawn out of darkness and in the light. There is something about you that's distinct, not because of what you do, not because of some way that you've behaved, but because something has been done for you and you see it clearly. You understand it. You receive it. You've changed your thinking in light of it. Because of that, it's a game changer and now you're different. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. This last part's really complicating. In fact, it actually can be a a real um, stumbling block for some people. 
Because it's easy to fixate on the words good works and totally miss what Jesus is saying. Like some people, like you hear this, you go, wait, wait, wait a second. <laughs> good works. Like we think good works and immediately we go, isn't that religion? And, and isn't Jesus saying, well, here's the deal. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. So if you behave this way, then people are going to look at you. If you mind your P's and Q's, which by the way, I don't even know what that means. But if you do that, right, which is scary. But if you, if you do that, if you, if you obey the rules, if you clean it up, if you never let any foul thing come from your mouth, or you never, you know, if you just like live the perfect squeaky clean life, then, then if you do those things, then God's going to be praised for that. Is that what he's saying? No, not even, right? See, there are nuances to this idea of good works. When he's, what he's describing, what he's helping us understand is in light of all of this that's been going on and being said to us, of knowing that God is near, knowing that he's with us, that his grace has showered us, his love has come over us, that when we live in this place, there is something that happens to us. This, this idea of good works, truly it's talking about the way that we live our lives and, and the nuance of the Greek word, Good works speaks to, to the creative side of who we are. It speaks to the art of who we are. It speaks to this expression, the entrepreneurial dynamic of, of who we are as human beings. It talks about this life that we are creating. It is who we are and how things are being shaped around us. And I know this is a difficult distinction, but it's not talking about behaviorism. He's talking about the very essence of who you are and what it is that your life produces around you. Your good works are this expression of you with all of this light and saltiness in the culture around you. That's what he's describing. Jesus is describing the life of a person who has received his love and grace. He, he's, he's, he's describing the ones that despite not having it all together, they've somehow been awakened from their slumber. The light has switched and now they see things as they are. The ones who, who simply live their experience exemplifying what it means to be accepted completely and wholly by God. It's people who understand what it means to be loved without condition. He's talking about people who live out out of that place. That's what he's describing. He's saying, listen, if, if, if you are that kind of person who you acknowledge the things th that I'm showing you and you walk into your week, if you walk into your days and into the place where you work and there's a conversation and you find yourself listening and saying, God, I want you to lead me in this conversation or I want you to show me something or I want you to teach me. If you walk into a scenario where there's conflict and people are angry with you and, and you find yourself saying, I'm not gonna find my approval in whether or not people agree with me or not or whether or not they, they like my ideas, but I'm gonna find it in you, if you're the kind of person who begins to transform your perspective of yourself and where you live, if all of those things start coming together, he's saying you are the kind of person that now illuminates in the darkness. Like there is this glow from you as a person who has peace amidst trial and joy when no one else could imagine having joy. You're the kind of person who has grace and life and truth to speak. Somehow you become a light in the darkness. You become the salt that keeps the meat from rotting around us. We know what this is like, don't we? How many times have we been in the middle of a conversation, someone's fighting, arguing, debating something, and you just see this thing's falling apart, and God says, but because you're there, it doesn't have to. We see darkness all around, and, and people are retreating and running away, or they're just fumbling around, and God says, somebody can turn the lights on. That's what Jesus is describing. See, it's, it's not our behavior that sets us apart. What sets us, sets us apart is that in spite of our condition, we're the alive ones. You're alive. So, so there's this paradox. In some way, disciples, Christ followers, whatever you want to call yourself, if you follow Jesus, you are no different than anyone else, and yet simultaneously, you are different than everyone else. And you know who Jesus is talking to in this moment? Not just a group of people on, on a hillside. He's talking to you. And he's talking to me. He's saying, you are the light that drives out the darkness. You are. It's you. You are the preservative. You are strategically placed wherever it is you find yourself to bring light 
and to keep things from falling apart. You matter. Do, do you see why this changes our understanding of ourselves? Like suddenly God's saying, wait a second, you, you're here for a reason. So this narrative of our lives, the school and the house and the, the work and the friends and the entertainment, all of these things, these are just bit parts in the larger story. Like, this is just the setting. This isn't the stuff. This is the context for the larger narrative, the larger story that's going on in us. You know what I love about this? You know what I love about God looking at his people and saying, you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. The thing I love the most about this is that he believes in them. He loves them. He sees their future. He sees this ragtag group of people, whether it's them or whether it's us, and he goes, you, you are the light of the world. You, it's you. He's speaking out in front of them, on behalf of them. I mentioned that yesterday uh, Meg had two soccer games, and uh, the second game that we went to, they let me back on the coaching side of the field, which again, I'm not sure I really have permission to be there. I don't know they just don't know how to deal with me. So, um, but the second game was really interesting because the first game was really bad and the girls played great, but they just got annihilated. And they played really good soccer. Sometimes that happens. And, and, and my, my youngest daughter, Meg, she is, um, she's a really good soccer player. Like, she's really good, like really solid. And I'm not, this isn't just like proud dad. Like, I mean, there's proud dad here that would say she's the best player ever to walk, walk the earth. But but um, and she's not, she's, but she's really good. She's just a super solid, really good soccer player. And, uh, and, and what I love about her is that she works really hard at getting better. So she's just, I mean, constantly, she's in the front yard doing stuff. If there's a, a place where she can go do drills or work on stuff with other players, she's always the one on her team that shows up at everything, every practice, all the time, always working. And it shows, like, there's times when you're just, like, watching, and I've seen her grow from when she was really young playing to where she is today. And it's like, man, she's really fun to watch, and she's really athletic. She's not the biggest kid like she's not I mean there's like girls at times it's like David and Goliath you know like 12 and 13 year old girls you know how this is and like some of them are like six foot nine 220 and look like they should be playing for WSU right and so there's times like she's out there and I'm like fearing for her life but but it's just so fun to watch her and as the last like year and a half or two years have gone by um she's been getting so much better and and, and there's been this thing that's kind of started to, to like a a pressure, a tension that's starting to arise there, and it's this. Um, my daughter plays right forward. Forwards are expected or expect something to happen in the game of soccer. What is it? Score, right? I cannot remember my daughter ever scoring a goal in her life. She's a really good soccer player, and, and she swears that maybe she did when she was young, and we should have taken pictures had we known it would be the last time. Um, so over the past, over the past like year and a half, you know, the thing I just keep doing is just reminding her, you are such a great player. And like, she's been a part of so many assists. Like the kid can shoot the ball in front of the goal and she knows how to place it. She knows how to center it. Like she's got great control constantly. She's the one responsible for getting the ball from the midfield down in in an opportunity to score. Like she's really good at these things. And so I just keep saying, you are so good at this. You're so excellent. We keep talking about it. I keep predicting and saying one of these days, this is how it's going to go down. One of these days, things are going to happen and the moment's going to be there and the ball's going to go in and just like all this stuff, right? So I've been imagining this in my mind and I know that she has too. Like, when would this thing ever happen? Well, yesterday during her second game, standing there on the sideline and all of a sudden, there's this girl that's like a foot taller than her and like 50 pounds heavier and she's been beating her up all game and she has just kept working and working and working and then there was this moment and I saw her kind of make the move and she juked this girl move the ball around, do this little crossover thing, goes around her, and now she's got, she's got wheels. Because she's small, she's fast, and so now she's booking, and she's moving fast, and there's a defender who runs out on her, and she was just like, whoop, see ya, went around that person, and then all of a sudden, I saw something happen that she had rarely ever done before. Her trajectory changed towards the goal, and rather than going to the corner and crossing, there was this moment, and I was like, this is it, this is it. And the look on her face 
was this look of absolute total passion, like this is going to happen. And she's flying. Another defender comes by, and all of a sudden, like she plants, her leg comes through, and as it comes through, the ball rockets off. Like any adult would have been afraid of this ball. It is so fast moving, flies over the goalie into the upper corner of the net. And I lost my mind. I was like, for years. Yeah, I was like, woo! Like, she did it, right? Like, I just, like, absolutely so excited. Like, I'm like, I can't believe this. Like, the other coaches who have been in the same place, like, she's so good. I can't believe she doesn't. Like, they were high-fiving each other, and they're like, yeah, we're just, we're going nuts. We're like, oh, my, I can't believe this has happened. Like, she's never scored before, you know? Two minutes later, you know what she did again? She scored again. Like, all of a sudden, she's just like, I can do this, right? In fact, the second score was so good because when she did it, she was going down to the ground, and she launched the ball, and so she was on the ground. And later when I asked her about it, she said, yeah, Dad, I didn't even know if it went in. I just knew it was a good shot. I'm like, that a girl, that a girl. Like, there was just this swagger that came about, right? <laughs> like, suddenly, she was playing like the girl that I knew that she's been all along, right? And she was in that place as well. When our Heavenly Father looks at us and he says, you're the light of the world or you're the salt of the earth, you know what he's doing? He's just seeing you for who he knows you are. He speaks out in front of us. And can I just say this? If your Heavenly Father isn't holding your past or holding your present against you, why would you? If your Heavenly Father isn't holding your past or your present against you, why would you look at your life and where you've been or, or where you are now or the mess that, that you're finding? Your, why would you, if your heavenly father sees you the way he sees you, why would you see yourself any differently? He loves you. He says, you. Yeah, I know it's messed up. I know your story has parts you never would have written, but you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, and somehow in all of that mixed up, messed upness of who you are, there's an opportunity to just flip the light switch and to shake salt and to stop the decomposition and to push out the darkness. You, you are incredibly powerful right where you find yourself. So powerful that, that what Jesus describes is that the people watching, not the church watching, not the Christians watching, not God watching, but that people living life alongside of you as they see this amazing, beautiful life that's being lived, they'll actually praise God. They'll acknowledge the existence of God, which I'll be honest, sometimes people look at my life and I think, I am evidence that God exists, right? <laughs> how, do, how do we become these people? It is not an act of the will. It is simply a response to knowing what God has done for us. That in our brokenness, he meets us. That in our lostness, he finds us. That in the darkness, he draws us out and gives us back to the world and says, you, wherever you go, wherever you play, wherever you work, wherever you find yourself, illuminate the darkness, keep the disintegration from happening. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Would you stand with me? Lord, I truly believe that the more we understand your grace for us, the more we understand um, your love for us, the mercy that you have shown us, the more we see the picture you have of us, of us being the salt and us being the light, the more I'm convinced that we become people who carry less of a burden and people who hold less tightly to the philosophies and the religions of this world. Lord, I'm convinced that the more we understand the relationship that you've offered us, the more of a blessing we get to be to the people around us. Lord, so many of us in this room, we have things we're just holding on to, stuff we feel like we've had to scrub clean to get close to you. There's, there's things in our story that we've thought, man, I can't even be used because of this. I'm just trying to hold on for dear life. Lord, there's so many of us in the, in, in the room that have invested so much of our life in our address, 
or our furnishings or our couches or our careers or our cars, that giving up on it just seems so difficult. And yet for all of us, Lord, I pray that you would deeply work in our souls and open our eyes, open our hearts to what it is you have for us. That we would know what it feels like to be salt and light in this world. We love you, Jesus, and I pray this in your name. Amen.